Good morning, Lord Reid. Uh, in a moment or two, uh, Eliga will uh, invite you to take the affirmation. Um, but let me first explain the arrangements. You're talking in this room to a rather select uh, group of people, um, probably those who have survived the, the heat and the travel difficulties it brought this week more than most. Uh, to your left, uh, there are lawyers who seem to turn up whatever the weather, um, and uh, at the back there are some representatives of the, the press. However, the big audience for what you have to say, the bigger audience, uh, will be online, uh, watching on live stream or YouTube around the country, I expect, particularly in Scotland, because of the nature of your, your evidence. But first, uh, Elega, uh, the oath. Please state your full name. John Reed. And repeat after me. I do solemnly, sincerely. I do solemnly, sincerely. And truly declare and affirm. And truly declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Lord Reed, could, I'm, uh, I'm sorry. Sorry, could I have a little more volume on the uh, speakers? Thank you. Ms. Richards. Um, Lord Reed, I'm going to start with an overview of your political just, career. Just let me stop you there. Is that all right? Yes, a little more would be helpful. I'm getting old. Well, we, we'll see what we, see how we, it goes. we, we yeah. can do. Uh, if you take it a little more slowly than otherwise, it might help. Okay, thank you. So you were first elected as an MP in 1987? Yes. And you remained an MP until 2010? Correct. You didn't seek re-election in the 2010 general election, uh, but you, were, uh, you became a life peer in, in 2010? Correct. Um, prior to becoming a peer, um, your title was Dr John Reed, but that's not a medical qualification, that's an academic qualification. It is, exactly. Um, it's a PhD in history, uh, but it, it doesn't involve any particular medical knowledge. Um, I'm going to ask you to, to look at your statement and your description of your ministerial roles over the years. Um, Lawrence, can we have WITN 0793001 and go to page four? At the bottom of the page, we have the heading Government Appointments. Uh, and we can see that your first ministerial appointment was May 1997, Minister of State in the Ministry of Defence, and you held that role for just over a year until July 1998. Yes, Minister for uh, Her Majesty's Armed Forces. And then if we go over the page to the table on the next page, we can see between July 1998 and May 1999, you were a Minister of State in the Department for the Environment, Transport and the Regions. Uh, and then you had your first cabinet role in May 1999 when you were appointed as Secretary of State for Scotland. That was the first full cabinet role, but the previous one, Minister for Transport, was at the cabinet, but not paid as a cabinet minister. Um, you held the post of Secretary of State for Scotland until January 2001. Uh, you then became Secretary of State for Northern Ireland between January 2001 and October 2002. Uh, then um, Minister Without Portfolio and Labour Party Chair, October 2002 to April 2003, and then April 2003 uh, to June 2003, so a short period of time, you were Lord President of the Council and Leader of the House of Commons. Um, you then became Secretary of State for Health on the 12th of June 2003, and, and that's obviously what I'm going to be asking you about. You held that position until the 6th of May 2005. You then became Secretary of State for Defence for approximately a year, and then Home Secretary for just over a year. That, that is correct. There is an apparent contradiction, um, because as it says there accurately, I was Home Secretary until the 28th of June, but the next paragraph actually says that I resigned in May, 
rather than June. Uh, it's only an apparent contradiction because I actually um, announced in May that I would go uh, on the same day that uh, Tony Blair, the Prime Minister, would go. So I announced some seven weeks in advance that I would resign as Home Secretary on that date. Now, we can see from that that you've held a number of different ministerial roles over the years, some for comparatively short periods of time before moving to another ministerial role in a different department. Were there, or did, bring, did that bring with it particular advantages or disadvantages in general terms? In general terms, from my personal point of view, um, mainly disadvantages. I would much rather have stayed in some of these roles for a much longer period. Um, but it seems that every time Prime Minister Blair had a problem, I seemed to be part of the solution. So he kept moving me from one place to another. But I would much rather have spent a prolonged period of time uh, in more departments. I think the second thing is that um, for some of these, I regarded myself as, with all humility, as being reasonably well prepared. For instance, my first job, I had done six years in opposition. Uh, I knew a bit about Scotland, obviously. I knew a bit about Northern Ireland, coming from the west of Scotland. Um, I knew nothing at all about health, and nothing at all about transport before I went into them. Um, have you, we can take that down, thank you, Lawrence. Have you previously given evidence to any other inquiries on the issues with which this inquiry is concerned? Not in this particular issue, no. Uh, um, do you recall if you were asked to give evidence to the Penrose inquiry, which was the Scottish inquiry conducted into infected blood matters? I don't think I was. I can't recall having been asked. Um, now, if, if I can turn to your appointment as Secretary of State for Health, as I understand it, you were appointed in a reshuffle following the resignation of Alan Milburn. Yes, Alan Milburn uh, genuinely wanted to spend more time with his family uh, and resigned. And Tony Blair invited me um, to become health secretary. When I say invited, when the prime minister invites you to do something, it's pretty much, uh, well, it's very difficult not to take it, even though I knew nothing about it. Wikipedia reports Private Eye reporting your response to your appointment in less than enthusiastic terms. I won't repeat what Private Eye says you said, but um, is it true that you had a degree of reluctance about taking up the health post, and if so, why? Yes, I did. I won't quote what Private Eye said either. Uh, it was something like, good heavens, not health. Uh, to that and, effect, yes. And more Glaswegian language. Yeah, I, I was a bit, I wouldn't say reluctant. I was apprehensive for two reasons, both of which I explained to Prime Minister Blair. The first was that um, I was a Scot, and we now had devolved Scottish health to the Scottish Parliament. And yet, here he was putting me into a position as head of the English Health Service. And the second reason was that I thought um, that I had no experience at all uh, in the area of health and wondered if that was a good thing. Um, so I had a discussion, and his view I remember, and I'm paraphrasing it, but on the first point, which was I was a scholar, he said there was no constitutional disadvantage, and anyway, he he thought I was a quick learner. Um, he also thought that it would benefit from a fresh pair of eyes. And on the second one, uh, which was uh, that I had very little, ex uh, sorry, on the first one, which was I was a Scot, he, he saw no constitutional uh, disadvantage or prohibition. Uh, and in fact, throughout my period, I have to say, I, I didn't find any accusations of, of, of being in the wrong place because I was Scottish. On the second one, which is my lack of experience, he said, well, you're a quick learner and we will benefit from a fresh pair of eyes looking at some of these issues. 
Um, if we turn back to your statement again, WITN 0793001, page 8, you've listed the junior ministers in post at the Department of Health during your time. Um, so we have um, John Hutton, Rosie Winterton, Lord Warner, Melanie Johnson, Dr. Ladyman, and Baroness Andrews. Um, and you tell us in your statement, and indeed we see it from the documentation, that responsibility for blood and blood policy rested with Melanie Johnson, the Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for Public Health. That's correct. Um, you'll be familiar in the inquiry about the delegation of specific areas to junior ministers, either at Minister of State or at Parliamentary uh, Secretary of State. And Melanie Johnson was the person who was prima, primarily in charge of, of all blood-related issues. Just as a general comment, you will also see that almost all these ministers were appointed on the same day as me. So I was very glad that they left John Hutton there because he'd been, I think, six years there and therefore was a valuable source of continuity and experience on a whole range of issues. Um, do, do you have any recollection of how the allocation of responsibilities was made? Was it something you had a say in, uh, or, or, or how, how, how did it happen? Um, I can't actually recall. Um, so I, I take it that they were appointed by the Prime Minister to Minister of State roles, and then to the next level, which was the Parliamentary Secretary of State roles. And the portfolio tended to follow the, uh, the rank of the minister. Uh, I can't remember changing any of them. Um, in, in other jobs I did, I remember in, in, the, in the Home Office, I, within a fortnight, I changed the role of two ministers of state because I thought they were particularly well qualified for the other area. And, and shifted them across. But I can't remember doing it here, so I, I take it that Norman Warner was obviously in the House of Lords, so automatically he became the Minister in the House of Lords. John, was, John Hutton was the senior uh, of the two Ministers of State, so he obviously had the large and most important portfolio, and in a sort of sense was deputy to me, uh, although not formally in, in practice, um, and the two under secretaries would take a huge amount of workload, uh, sorry, per, uh, parliamentary secretaries would take a huge amount of the workload, including a lot of correspondence, and they would have divided up between them. But I can't remember any controversy or, or uh, intentional decisions to move people's posts. Now, in your statement, um, you've also described a range of challenges facing the NHS matters that you had to deal with. I'm not proposing to go through them, but you explain in your statement that you could not be involved in all the work of the Department of Health, and that you would expect to be consulted on major policy issues on matters of political prominence. Yes. Um, I think in this, as in other departments, I would delegate... Um, specific areas and responsibilities to, to my ministers. I would assume that uh, they were self-starters, that they were competent and capable until proven otherwise. Uh, I would let them get on with that job as far as possible. But if there was a major political issue, then that would either come directly to me or I expect them to refer it to me. If there was a matter of huge controversy, a train coming up the tunnel, I would expect them to uh, let me know that they had a significant problem. Uh, and if there was anything about which they wanted guidance, then they could come and see me. Other than that, then you would devolve the responsibilities to the junior ministers. And so we can take that down there. If there were going to be... Um, issues of expenditure, so additional expenditure, approaches were going to have to be made to the Treasury. Again, I'm talking in general terms. We'll look at specifics later this morning. Would that, too, be something you'd expect to come to you as Secretary of State? 
If it was a significant amount, yes. I mean, the relationships between government departments would be continual at the level of officials. There would always be discussions going on. Um, it's just in the nature of government. Um, if it was a relatively small amount, then it wouldn't necessarily come to the Secretary of State. But if it was a significant increase in expenditure that was different from that had been agreed and planned in the budget, particularly if it required uh, seeking permission from the Treasury or extra money from the Treasury, yeah, that would come up to at least John Hutton and very probably to me as Secretary of State. Um, in, in terms of interactions with ministers in your department, uh, did you have regular meetings, weekly or, or, or however it might be, or was it more ad hoc? Um, do you know, for, for the life of me, I can't remember what exactly the arrangements were in the, in the Department of Health, and, and for, for very good reasons, I haven't been able to discuss it with any of my colleagues, so they haven't been able to remind me. Uh, that's the rules of the inquiry, which I fully accept. Um, I think, and it's my recollection, that we would meet as a group about once a month, and we would... Uh, also meet individually with ministers about once a month, and then on specific areas, um, for instance, before health questions, uh, which is once a month, we would, we would meet, or if there was a particular um, topic of extraordinary importance, we would meet as a group. That's my recollection, but to, to be quite truthful, I, I can't say that I, I fully recollect the nature of or the regularity of our meetings. Um, and, and, and leaving aside the, um, how often you had meetings um, with your officials, did you have a system of regular interaction with the, um, with the permanent secretary? Yes, um, but in addition to that, if the permanent secretary had particular problems, then he would speak to me. But on... But on big ticket issues, like, can I give you an example? Yes, of course. Um, I mean, one of the great problems we faced back then was that we regarded the number of people on the waiting list and the, the length of time they had to wait uh, is far too great. I mean, it looks, it looks <laughs> very small now. We were talking about a million people. At present, there's six and a half million on the waiting list, but we regarded that as a pretty scandalous number and we wanted to reduce it by half over five years. Secondly, the waiting time for elective operations was a maximum of three years, which meant hundreds of thousands, millions of people were waiting up to three years in pain, in fear, in anxiety, and therefore I decided that I would uh, reduce the maximum waiting time over a period of four years to 12 weeks. And that was enough to bring a whole tranche of top people to my desk, uh, including the permanent secretary. He had to be there. And there was initially considerable resistance to the idea that it was possible um, until I explained that if they didn't do it, then um, I would buy I think it was seven million operations from the private sector and give them free to people in the NHS because that was, you know, their NHS. Um, and after that, the permanent secretary, I think, encouraged the other directors to find the solution to the problem that had appeared uh, unattainable. And they came back eventually and said, we can't do 12, but we could do 18 weeks. And I said, fine, uh, we'll accept that as a compromise. And actually, over a period of four years, we did. So uh, on issues of that magnitude, which required a whole restructuring and a whole re-emphasis of our hospitals and the NHS towards very ambitious goals, of course, the permanent secretary would have been involved in that. And then the chief medical officer, to, to what extent did you have regular dealings with the chief medical officer? I had regular dealings and very often 
debates with the chief medical officer, who was Liam Donaldson, now Sir Liam Donaldson, um, who was a tremendous uh, help to me over s specific issues like VCJD that we may come on to, um, uh, on the background to the medical and clinical issues with which I had to engage, um, and over issues like public health, the smoking ban, and so on. And we had a very active relationship. And, and then during your time as Secretary of State for Health, to what extent did you have direct interactions with or meetings with patients or patient groups? Yes, almost constantly, uh, insofar as your diary allowed. Part of it was meeting with groups um, in Parliament, like the uh, all-party group uh, chaired by Michael Connerty MP that uh, was particularly engaged in hepatitis C issues. Uh, part of it outside. Um, in terms of actually consulting and negotiating, it would normally be done by a junior minister, these meetings. Uh, but of course, I spent quite a a lot of time visiting hospitals and clinics and some of the new hubs that were being set up and so on. So there was, there was quite an active um, uh, participation in the patient side of the health service. But most, I think my recollection is, most meetings with um, representative groups whether it was on Hep C or whether it was an HIV or, or another specific issue, most of them, I think, would have been done by John Hutton or the other uh, junior ministers. Um, can I just take you back to your time as Secretary of State for Scotland? Yeah. Now, your appointment largely coincided with um, the coming into effect of, of the Scotland Act yes. and the Scottish Parliament it did. Um, um, uh, uh, um, sitting. And as you've said, health was a, a matter devolved to Scotland. During your period as Secretary of State for Scotland, do you recall having any um, um, specific uh, dealings with matters relating to either health generally in Scotland or specifically issues relating to infected blood? and financial support in Scotland? I think the answer to that is no, precisely because I became Secretary of State after my predecessor, Donald Dewar, moved from the position of Secretary of State for Scotland to become First Minister of Scotland. That was precisely at the time when the powers were devolved, uh, and therefore health was a devolved issue and given the sensitivities that followed devolution, um, even if I had been approached to get involved in an issue that had been devolved to the Scottish Parliament, I think I would have been very wary of it. So I can't recall that I was involved at, at any stage in that. There, was, there were great sensitivities, some of which are actually subsequently illustrated on both extremes uh, during the, uh, the period where we were talking about Hep C. You, you can see from the papers that there is a suspicion on the part of some officials, particularly in the Treasury, that we don't want the Scottish tail wag wagging the, you know, the English dog, as it were. And you can also see from some of the press coverage in Scotland that when we were working in partnership with the Scottish Parliament on the Hep C scheme, uh, the Skipton Fund, um, that there was accusations, oh, this is a Westminster controlled area. It was almost the mirror image. So I think we'll, what it's worth remembering is that in the period after devolution, we had to overcome these mutual suspicions. I didn't have a problem with it because I had been arguing for devolution. In fact, I wrote the 90, along with Gordon Brown and one or two others, wrote the 1980 uh, devolution paper of the Labour Party. So I was very comfortable with what we were doing, but not everyone was, obviously. And then the same question in relation to your time in Northern Ireland. Um, a lot was happening in Northern Ireland at that time, um, unrelated to health. 
do you recall health coming across your desk or, or any issue relating to in infected blood coming across your desk? Uh, no, I don't. I don't. Um, and then, can I ask you a, a little more generally about... Can, can, I yes. just, can I just add to that? Um, and remember, when I was Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, the Northern Ireland Assembly had already been established. Therefore, it had devolved powers, and one of those powers devolved to it was health. So, for, for the same reason, I wouldn't have been di directly involved in an issue that was the responsibility of the Northern Ireland Assembly. Um, can, can I then ask you a little more generally about the interactions between a spending department, particularly a large spending department such as the Department of Health and the Treasury? We'll look at the specifics in relation to the, what became the Skipton Fund um, shortly. Um, but, but more generally, how, how was the relationship between you as Secretary of State for Health and the, the Chief Secretary? Uh, on personal terms, uh, fine. Um, I was an admirer of Paul Boateng, he was capable, and indeed his boss, the Chancellor, Gordon Brown, who, who was a Scot. Uh, and I had known for many years in personal terms. In institutional terms, um, it, it, the relationship was an imbalanced one because the spending departments can only proceed by grace of the Treasury. It's the Treasury that holds the keys to um, the coffers. And paradoxically, the bigger you are, the more you're dependent of course, from the Treasury, because you're spending larger amounts of money. So um, just as, as background may be helpful, between 97 and, 97 and 99, the, Labor, the new Labour government uh, held a very tight rein on finances. From about 2000, it released it a bit, and that was a period when a great deal of money was put into public services, including uh, the Department of Health. But between two uh, that had to apply for a period of about four or five years, which meant that when I came in in 2003, the budget had been sort of three years in, pretty much set in stone. It had been reviewed the year before. Um, so it was natural that going back to the Treasury to say, hold on a second, I'd like some more money, uh, wasn't going to be received with open arms. And as I said, they were the most powerful department in government. Now, I'm going to turn to the issue of financial support for those infected <coughs> with hepatitis C from blood and blood products. The evidence the inquiries heard indicates that uh, at the point you came into the department, the department had a long-standing policy of, of being opposed to financial support for those infected with hepatitis C, including your immediate predecessor, Mr Melbourne, and who gave evidence to the inquiry um, last week. Um, now, I, I want to look at the announcement you made in August of 2003 first, the announcement in principle to set up a fund, and then we'll go back in time and look at the, okay. the period between June, June and, and August. Um, but if we just turn to that so we know what we're talking about. Lawrence, it's NHBT 0015207 underscore 002. Um, so th this is the press release, um, 29th of August 2003, and it records your announcement of the establishment of a financial assistance scheme for people infected with hepatitis C as a result of being given blood products by the NHS. It records you saying that after you became Secretary of State for Health, Secretary of State, you looked at the history, decided on compassionate grounds it was the right thing to do, uh, and you decided in principle that the um, English hepatitis C sufferers should receive ex gratia payments from the Department of Health. And we can see it records details of the payment have yet to be worked out. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you why you took that decision a little later. Uh, um, what I want to understand is, is why was it, that, what, how did this become a decision or an issue that you took charge of, bearing in mind all the 
responsibilities that you had as Secretary of State for Health. This is something that came across your desk pretty early on. How did it come to be something that you had a personal direct involvement in? Um, I'm afraid I have to jump back a bit. Yes, absolutely. I, I mean, I came in, I think, around the 12th or 13th of June. Uh, unknown to me, uh, the Scottish First Minister, Jack McConnell, who I knew well, um, and uh, because actually I knew Jack from university, he was a bit younger than me, but so I knew him all through the, the Labour Party, and Malcolm Chisholm, who was the Scottish Health Minister, who I also knew well because Malcolm had been a member of Parliament before he went, became a member of the Scottish Parliament. He was an MP and he was a colleague of mine. Uh, apparently, um, they had indicated that they wanted to speak to the new Secretary of State. And this, from the documents that you were kind enough to send me, <laughs> several thousand of them, um, this caused a frisson, I think, of, of excitement among officials. Uh, I didn't know this at the time, but I'm reading the documents that you've sent me um, because it, they thought, oh, they, they want to speak to the Secretary of State about hepatitis C financial assistance, which up to that point, as you said, the department had said constantly, no, we're not going to pay it. Um, as a result of that, um, a few days after I came in, there was submissions put to me, and I can't recollect whether it was meetings, but there would have been with officials, saying uh, the First Minister and, and the Health Minister of Scotland wish to speak to you. Um, it's about hepatitis C payments, and uh, basically here is our position, and our position is that the, there's no fault, therefore there's no compensation. Um, and that's how the issue arose, and that's why it would have been at my level it arose, because of a request from, from the Scottish First Minister and the, uh, and the, the Scottish Health Minister. And, and just to pick it up from the documents for the benefits of those <clears throat> um, watching and listening, if we have DHSC 5541406, We can see if we look at the bottom of the page, the communication on the 17th of June, so as you say, just a few days um, uh, after you've taken up your post, referring to um, uh, um, both the Secretary of State for the Department of Work and Pensions and uh, Malcolm Chisholm and Jack McConnell wanting to speak to you about hepatitis C. It says at the moment Secretary of State is totally unsighted on this. Is that, is that accurate at that point in time? Yes, it is, because prior to becoming Health Secretary, I did a period as Chairman of the Party and, and Leader of the House, so I would not have been aware that Malcolm Chisholm had made this announcement in January. Obviously, you know, that was explained to me, but at the time this was written, I wouldn't know anything about the Scottish decision. Um, and then it records to what's it records what's described as Malcolm Chisholm's unilateral announcement of Scotland's um, uh, uh, position. And if we go over the page... Yeah, that's a peculiar wording, isn't it? Um, this indicates the sort of uh, almost sublimal... Um, why unilateral? I mean, Scotland would be perfectly entitled to make a, a decision on their own without it being said to be unilateral any more than England. But it's, it's kind of indicative of, of some of the um, suspicions that were around. I have to say on both sides, in the Scottish Parliament as well. They were constantly worried about Westminster control. And, and if we pick it up, um, it continues, breaching the principle we'd all UK-wide adhered to, that there would be no such scheme, DH, DWP and HMT, so that's the Treasury, have all been very firm that Scotland should not go ahead unilaterally with the financial assistance scheme and that we share a strong concern about the financial knock-on to England and other devolved administrations if Scotland breached the principle um, on hepatitis C and compensation. 
and, and then there's reference to work with the DWP to look at whether the Scots in any case have the right to do this unilaterally as social security matters are reserved, not devolved. And reference to waiting for the view of the Attorney General, which came shortly after this, had been requested at the end of January. Uh, and then it says, obviously, this will be quite a difficult one for the Secretary of State, given that he's a Scottish MP now in charge of the NHS in England. Uh, it doesn't sound as though that it was a particular difficulty from your perspective in that regard. I found no difficulty in making a decision whatsoever. Um, but in, in terms of what's set out in the, in the rest of that paragraph, do, do, does that reflect, again, the tensions you've been talking about, this sense of what might be said to be almost indignation, that Scotland are doing something where... Um, there'd been a shared understanding that I think, it... I think that's part of it, but the other, the other element of it is um, we have a historic line on this. You know, it, it, and the problem is that this is challenging that line. And, you know, that, that's kind of uncomfortable for people. Sometimes necessary, but it's uncomfortable. Um, if we look at WYTN 0793002, um, we can see that by the 23rd of June, so not very much longer, uh, not, not very long after the, the um, uh, um, communication we looked at, the second paragraph says, Secretary of State's due to speak to Secretary of State at DWP in about an hour's time. He may then want a meeting with officials to discuss, although he has said that given both the precedent on HIV and the likely Scottish decision to now go ahead, it looks as though we will, on the basis of fairness, have to go down the compensation ex gratia route. If so, it's likely Secretary of State will want Sorry, to announce. Um, I don't think I have that one in front of me. Could you... Just tell me which one we're looking at. So it should be, I'm so sorry, Lord Reed, let me take it more carefully. It should be in front of you, and uh, I hope the passage has been highlighted okay. for you. Thank you. Okay. So um, it refers to you being having a conversation with the Secretary of State at the DWP, and then it refers to um, you having said that given both the precedent on HIV and the likely Scottish decision to now go ahead it looks as though we will, on the basis of fairness, have to go down the compensation ex gratia route. Yes. Now, that tends to suggest that you have fairly quickly decided that you are going to reverse the long-standing policy and opt for some form of financial support for hepatitis C uh, sufferers infected through blood and blood products. Is that right? That is correct, yes. Um, um, what, what was it that led you to take that decision and take it so quickly? Well, my recollection, uh, and again, there's, you know, there's nothing in the documentation that really explains my reflections and, and thoughts about it. My, my recollection is that, well, to put it simply, HIV sufferers had obviously gone through terrible traumas, pain, anxiety, and so on. But so had sufferers from hepatitis C. Um, and you could distinguish, and I think in documentation illustrates that people did try to distinguish between those suffering from HIV and those suffering from hep C. HIV tended to be younger, they died quicker, and so on and so forth. But to me, there were people suffering you know, maybe not identically, but suffering in, in the same sort of way, the anxiety, the fear, the, the deaths, the... Uh, and I didn't find the distinctions between HIV and hep C sufferers. It didn't persuade me that they were justified. Secondly, the cause of that suffering for both of those groups of people was the same route. It was infection through blood products or, or blood transfusions supplied by the state. And thirdly, I wasn't persuaded by the argument that there is no legal liability. I didn't believe there was a legal liability, 
But that, in my view, shouldn't... Um, uh, the obligations of the state go beyond legal liability. There is a moral compulsion on the state to protect its people. The old phrase, salus populi, which actually means the health of the people. Uh, and when an agency of the state, which is the National Health Service, uh, by its conduct, whether culpable or otherwise, results in the suffering of a lot of people, I thought that they should be treated in a, a, a manner that was just. Uh, and that's basically what I remember my thinking. Now, the Scots government had obviously come to that conclusion. And that was, that's not the reason that I uh, accepted or, or adopted my position because there were decisions taken by the government in Scotland over a whole range of issues with which I disagreed uh, and supported the UK government taking a different position. Nevertheless, it was the catalyst for prompting these discussions and, and making me think about it and bringing it to my attention. You know, this, if you like, fresh eyes that had just come in and, and the explanation had been given about why HIV people were getting financial uh, assistance and, and people with hep C whim. And I didn't find that persuasive, I'm afraid. And, and therefore, you, you know, if the line's wrong, you change the line. One of the arguments that had been advanced by officials and accepted by ministers over previous um, years had been this might be the slippery slope to general no-fault compensation. Do you recall being troubled by that or, or what your views were in relation to that? Yes, I, I, wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't troubled by that because that's an argument which in principle you could use for almost any change of policy. Oh, if you change this, then you might have to change something else. I understood what they were worried about, what was called the cascading effects. If you do this, it will lead on, if you do X, it will lead on to Y, and before we know it, we'll be bankrupt. I understood that. But as I said, I thought that our obligations went beyond legal liability and also, I knew a thing called ex gratia. Um, one of the jobs that I'd done before coming into, actually before even taking my degree or PhD, was in insurance. And when an insurance company wanted to pay, but didn't want to be committing themselves to a legal liability, then they very regularly paid a thing called an ex gratia payment. And I had known that when I became a minister, and I had used it at risk of, of diverting when I was Armed Forces Minister, a, a case of, of a lady whose son had died, he'd been killed in battle, and she hadn't been able to get the bottom of it, despite years of letters being sent and so on. And, and uh, I authorised an ex gratia payment and was told it was all very difficult and so on, but we eventually paid uh, an ex gratia payment to that lady. So I, in a small way, used it before. So once you count in as an ex gratia payment, the argument about the legal liabilities leading to a cascade um, are overcome. Of course, there was still the political pressure which would come from various other groups. But I thought this was sufficiently unique categorization. Those who, through blood transfusions, provided by an agent of the state, NHS, had contracted HIV, had contracted um, Hep C, had contracted VCGD or whatever, I thought that was, you could circumscribe that as a group. It didn't mean that others were without merit but it did mean that you weren't obliging yourself to respond to them the same way that I was responding to, to people who were suffering from hepatitis C. Sorry, that's rather long, but I hope it explains it. Now, the, um, the note that you'd received prior to taking your decision from officials 
had said the officials saw no justification for changing the long-standing policy. I don't propose to put it up on screen, but the reference um, for, for the record is... Let's find it. Um, DHSC 5320518. Um, you having taken a different decision... Did you encounter any resistance from officials? Did anyone try and talk you out of it or express a degree of concern at, at, at your change of direction? Neither on this issue or any other issue in the Department of Health. In fact, I would go so far as to say I had nine posts, as you pointed out at the beginning. And throughout it, of course, any large organisation has individuals who have their own views. But I found the civil service uh, perfectly willing to uh, follow a change of line. That was legal. That's legal. Um, I mean, it is the job of the civil service to point out to leaders like me the consequentials of what they're doing. They would be irresponsible and not uh, doing what they ought to be doing if they weren't saying, well, very well, Secretary of State, but have you thought of this? Now, I don't regard that as resistance. That's part of a dialogue and a debate. It's the job of civil servants to defend, quote, the line, which is actually the decisions taken by the pre-existing ministers. Uh, so I, I don't regard that as somehow a suspicious behaviour on the part of the civil service. But throughout my period of nine ministerial posts, I have to say that I found the civil service, when you took a lead and when you listened to them, but despite that you said, no, this is where we're going, I, I think they responded in, in a way that you would expect which is to say, this is the new line. The democratic leadership have decided it. Now let's do our best to implement it. And I think you can see that from the papers. Mr. Gutowski, who's saying one week, oh no, this is the line, Secretary of State. Once I've said, well, I've listened to you, but we're, sorry, we're changing that. The next week, Gutowski's busy arranging meetings with the Scots to try and put together um, a project that this new Secretary of State has brought in, which is a reversal of 25 years of, of where the department has been. So I, I, I hope that answers your question. Um, if we can then look at another document, which is DHSC 0042275 underscore 008. This is the 23rd of June. It records in the um, first paragraph of the email that you have spoken to Andrew Smith, who was the Secretary of State, Department of Work and Pensions. And it refers to the legal advice that this wasn't a social security issue. And just so that, again, so that those listening can follow. That, as I understand it, is a reflection of the advice received from, through the law officers' advice um, uh, that it wasn't Social Security, it was health, therefore it was a devolved, not reserved matter, and yeah. Scotland had the power to, to, to go it alone if they wanted to. Yeah, and from a purely budgeting point of view, this was probably, um, this legal advice was probably a great l relief to Andrew Smith, because it meant whatever happened, his department would not be asked to foot a bill. Um, uh, and then if we go to the um, last main paragraph of this document, so it's the long paragraph, please, Lawrence. Um, so it's the paragraph beginning ahead of this happening. Um, but I want to pick it up, third line down, it refers to the, that there's going to be a meeting that you have um, um, with Andrew Smith, Alistair Darling, possibly the Chief Secretary to the Treasury. And then it says, for that meeting... Secretary of State will need further advice on where we think the Scottish executive are at with their schemes, slash how quickly they could make an announcement, the financial implications of the various scheme options. I think following the Scottish Health Executive recommendations in full would cost around 400 million a year, 
compared to around 200 million for the lesser scheme I think Scotland is considering. Secretary of State will need advice on all this. And then it's this line I want to ask you about. And the need to convince Scotland to be as minimalist as possible. And then a question of who would foot the bill in mm. England. Um, now, that's from Sammy Sinclair in your private office, uh, um, suggesting that you will need advice um, uh, um, um, and flagging up as an issue the need to convince Scotland to be as minimalist as possible. Do you, do you have any observations on that particular issue? Um, only that it's, I haven't seen this before, until no. it was supplied the papers. This was written uh, from my office. Uh, one is that I'm not quite sure what, what uh, Sammy uh, means on this. Secretary of State will need advice on all this, which is fine and the need to convince Scotland to be as minimalist as possible, I think Sammy is asking the officials to give me advice of the need to convince Scotland. Um, I'm not sure it was ever given to me, and it certainly doesn't reflect my view. And Scotland, anyway, by this time, had their own scheme. And the idea that I was going to be phoning them up saying, you know, this is the Department of Health in England, I'm Secretary of State, you can't do this or that. It, I don't know if Sammy understood devolution, but it doesn't work that way. Not in my book anyway. You have a discussion with colleagues, and we had a very cooperative discussion over the, the coming months, as you can see from the papers. Uh, and basically, we accepted for reasons of speed, because it was, you know, 20 years overdue to give financial compensation, reasons of coherence that we thought that the same system should apply to everyone in the UK, simplicity. We basically accepted the Scottish scheme, um, far less, you know, far from going to them and trying to convince them one way or the other. Because if we'd have brought in a scheme that was more generous than the Scots, well, we couldn't afford it anyway, but if, had we done, it would have brought about a fracture of the cohesion of the United Kingdom. But I don't know. I mean, I can't recall. It may well be that at some stage somebody sent something from our office to, to Malcolm saying, be as minimalist as possible. But my recollection is that from the start, I, I to the best of my recollection, from the start, I thought, the Scots have got a template. It means it's simpler, speedier, more cohesive. Let's go on the Scottish version. I think it's right to say this, there wasn't a Scottish scheme set up at that stage, but there had been an announcement, yes. as you've already referred yes, to. Yes, it wasn't set up. Yeah. No, I accept that. But the, the, they were minded to do certain things. Yes. And they were the framework on which the UK scheme was based. Um, and then if we um, uh, just pick it up at DHSC 042275 <coughs> underscore 005. We can see um, th this is um, from, uh, at, um, looks like the private office of Andrew Smith to your private office and those of Alistair Darling and Paul Boateng. Uh, and if we go uh, further down the page... We can see it records in the first paragraph, our ministers met today to discuss compensation schemes for sufferers for hepatitis C. They agreed the following, UK government will introduce a scheme for hepatitis C sufferers in England. This is a devolved matter in Scotland and almost certainly in Wales and Northern Ireland also, Sammy Sinclair, to check this. And so it's for the devolved administrations to make their own decisions on this issue. This decision should be communicated to the devolved administrations by John Reid personally, when the further issues uh, have been worked through. Um, and then if we go over the page, paragraph three records, it was stressed that it will be important for departments to work closely with the devolved administrations once ministers have <coughs> communicated their decision to them. The Department of Health will take the overall lead in developing the policy along with the devolved administrations. So this would appear to be essentially the, the formal um, cross-government confirmation, you having met with ministerial colleagues in the UK government, that 
what you decided you wanted to do was essentially endorsed by your colleagues? Uh, yes, it was endorsed by them according to this. And that this was uh, 29th of June or thereabouts, 20th? 25th of June. 25th of June. So, I mean, basically it's, it's 12 days after I became Secretary of State. Um, so it was pretty rapid work. Um, not necessarily by me, but by officials. Um, that's the point I was making earlier, that, that having held this line for so long, and then this new guy came in and changed the line, the officials didn't resist it. They got down to, to working uh, where they could on this. And so within 13 days of me coming in, there's agreement across government uh, not just in the Department of Health. Yeah, OK, we accept. We're going with this. Um, and then if we pick matters up um, at DHSC 5094083. Um, this is Mr Gotowski to you and also to Mr Darling, Mr Smith and Mr Boateng, 1st of July, um, and it's a um, submission relating to, to various issues. Um, we can see there was a question about whether um, this was a devolved issue in relation to Wales, which was ultimately resolved following legal advice. Um, if we go down to the bottom of the page, the understanding at paragraph five was that the position in Northern Ireland was essentially the same as, as, as Scotland, that um, it was a matter for Northern Ireland to um, decide. If we go over the page, there was a discussion about options for setting up the scheme. Um, <coughs> we see the three options set out in paragraph six. I'm not going to read through those. And then if we get to um, the third page, please, Lawrence, bottom of the page under the heading financial implications. Um, paragraph 16 onwards um, deals with some of the issues relating to, to costing. So paragraph 16, the scheme the Scottish executive is considering would cost up to 210 million if a similar scheme were implemented in England, which is the basis upon which we are working. This is the worst case and assumes that all those infected are identified and make a claim. Uh, and, and then if, uh, if only 50% of the 5,000 5, unidentified people make a claim, costs are likely to be in the order of 140 million. If the payments detailed in the Scottish expert group proposals were accepted, then the costs would be up to 600 million. I'll come back to that, Lord Reid. Paragraph 17 records the Scottish executive proposed payments, the 20,000 and then the 25,000, um, which I'm going to refer to as stage one and stage two um, payments. And then if we go over the page, um, there's further discussion in relation to that. And then if we can pick it up at paragraph 21, we can see it records the proposed scheme makes no provision for making payments to the dependents of people with hepatitis C who've since died. The scheme proposed by the Scottish expert group did propose payments for dependents. It's possible we will come under pressure to extend the scheme in such a way. This would increase the cost substantially. It's also possible we will come under pressure to increase the value of the scheme towards that proposed by the Scottish experts group. Again, this could increase costs significantly, and I'll, I'll come back again to those issues a little later. And then funding the scheme, paragraph 22, as the law officers have ruled this is a health issue, the cost of the scheme in England would need to be borne by the Department of Health. And the Treasury have said that no additional funding would be available for a hepatitis C compensation scheme. Um, uh, and um, then if we go to the next page, just the conclusion... Paragraph 28, um, at your meeting on the 25th of June, it was decided that once further issues had been worked up, then John Reid would communicate the decision that the government would introduce a compensation scheme in England to the devolved ad administrations. Um, now, I'll, I'll come back to, to some of the, 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 the issues raised by that as we look through some of the later decisions. But in broad terms, it, is this right, that the decision in principle having been taken at that meeting on the 25th of June... The advice that you then receive is, is, al is already looking at, perhaps for the reasons you've already given, the Scottish 
uh, model, as recently announced, as the likely framework for what England would do. Correct. Um, um, and it, again, we'll look at some of the detail, but is it right to understand that that is essentially for reasons of finance rather than anything else? I wouldn't use the word essentially. Um, the main reason was that it gave us um, an expedition, an expeditious way into getting a UK scheme. The Scots had done more work on this. There had been no preparatory work done in, in the Department of Health in England for obvious reasons. The line for 20 years had been, no, we're not paying it. Uh, so here was a, a, a ready-made scheme that had been set up. Uh, so it was a template. Secondly, it meant that you had the beginnings of a UK-wide scheme so that people in one area of the UK weren't receiving more or less than people in the other side. And thirdly, it could be done a lot more quickly. Um, I mean, when we look at the time scale on this, it seems very slow to I understand that if you were suffering from um, hepatitis C. But to go from a standing start um, and achieve a scheme of this nature throughout the United Kingdom uh, with government departments agreeing and four nations coordinating it, to do that in a year um, is, is, is pretty quick in governments. Um, so it wasn't essentially a cost thing. Of course, cost comes into everything. And the scheme was unaffordable within our budget at 200 million, was more unaffordable at 400 million, and more un unaffordable at 600 million. But I was pretty certain we could get the 200 million. Uh, getting anything above that, tragically, at least in the short term, wasn't going to happen. But at the back of my mind, once you get a scheme in there, then you can always improve the scheme over time. But get it in, get it up and running, and bring some immediate relief to those who have been, quite frankly, deprived of that relief for a long time. At least some of those uh, who've been deprived of it. Um, and, and then just looking at paragraph 28 on the screen, um, the reference to, to you communicating the decision in relation to England to the devolved administrations. Um, as I understand it from the documents, and I, I don't think we need to go through each of them to, to establish this, there was obviously communication between you and Scottish ministers. Yeah. Um, but in relation to Wales and to Northern Ireland, they were not informed of... Um, uh, the proposal and, until a little further down the road. So they were informed by the time of the announcement on the 29th yeah. of August, but quite late in the day. It was. Wh why was that? Political handling. I mean, I, I thought that if we were dealing with several government departments in England, plus Scotland, and we were prepared to go along with the Scots on their plan, but we then introduced, at an early stage, uh, Northern Ireland and Wales. The thing would get bogged down, in my view, uh, far more than if we said to the Scots, OK, we'll go with your scheme, basically. Let's work it out. Then when we've got it, let's say to the Welsh and, and to the Northern Ireland people, this is our scheme. Do you want to join it? If you don't, fine, go your own way, create your own scheme, pay more, pay less, pay nothing. But I, it's purely a matter of political handling, if you understand what I'm saying. It was a far more coherent way of doing it than going into a consultation, you know, or, or risking that one of the devolved nations would want to go into an endless consultation on it. And I'm sorry if it appears as if I was bouncing them a bit. Um, I think there's an element of that, uh, but 
ultimately they had the choice. They could join us or, or not join us, but I, I was intent that I wanted a UK scheme and certainly wanted an English scheme. And, and I was pretty, um, pretty certain that the, the quickest and best and most coherent way of doing that was for us to do a deal with the Scots and then invite the other two nations to join us, which they did. And they did in very short order. Um, if we just go back then to the press release announcement uh, at NHBT 00152007 underscore 002. Now, um, we looked at this obviously already this morning. I just want to look at the the words that um, are attributed to you here. There are some background documents that I'm not going to go through, which are email exchanges about yeah. you know, what, what, how, why words would be in there or not in there and the use of the word compassionate and whether that should be in there or not. Um, um, but is it, is it right to understand that your thinking was, was essentially as you've described to us rather than the... The, the, the way in which it's put here, which is a rather more compressed explanation being given publicly. Yes. Um, I mean, I've asked myself, why did I do this by press release and not by a parliamentary statement? Uh, and I think the answer to that is probably the date of it, the 29th of August. Parliament wasn't sitting. And therefore, we had to put out a press release which kind of announced it rather than the traditional method of doing a ministerial statement and so on. Uh, why couldn't we have waited till Parliament came back? Because the timetable was sort of dictated by Malcolm Chisholm's requirement to appear before a Scottish committee. So that's why it was in a press release. The press release would have gone through various iterations. People would have had the word compensation in it and somebody would have objected. You know, you can't say compensation because that sounds as though there's a legal liability and so on. But I would ultimately have approved it. Um, and, I mean, basically, I think it encapsulates in a few words the decision that we had taken. I don't think it's inaccurate. And I certainly would have approved this. Um, and I think just in terms of the timing, Mr Chisholm was due to appear on the 9th of September before the Scottish Health Committee. He was due to appear on the 9th of September and he was under terrible pressure, which I understood, to come up with some form of announcement. Because remember, we had said, we want to join you in doing this, but we haven't got our ducks in a row, so can you hold on and, and not go, you know, the full extent of the committee meeting? But he's a politician who was going to be questioned the way you're questioning me today. So he had to have something to say to his committee. Um, and therefore, that committee, I think, was taking place on or around the 9th of September, 2003. Um, but he, ha he had to get his preparatory work done. So we got this out just at the end of August. And, and um, I think he would have issued a similar press release that day, as would Wales and, and Scotland. Um, um, and where it says that you've looked at the history of this issue, and again, so that there's no m misunderstanding about that, there hadn't been a detailed examination of past events. No, there, there hadn't been. Um, I didn't say to them, you know, I, I, want, I want an inquiry <laughs> into where we are. I had my feelings you may think right or wrong, that the way things had developed, there was an injustice to people who'd suffered from hep C compared to HIV. And therefore, I wanted to rectify that. And what it, the last thing really I wanted was, you know, an inquiry that would take years and stop a scheme being set up. I had made my mind. Now, that may have been wrong, but... Um, I was looking to the present and to the future and to the relief of suffering. Um, and 
I wasn't motivated by any desire to um, convince myself that this ought to be done. I knew it ought to be done. And then the, that last sentence of the press release, which says the details of the payments have yet to be worked out, which is correct. You had your idea as to what it was going to look like based upon um, the, the earlier announcements in, in, in Scotland. But the, the parameters of the scheme were yet to be d determined. Yes. Um, it, how unusual is it to, to make an announcement of this kind, an in principle announcement, before the details have been worked out? I don't think it's, I don't think it's entirely unusual. I, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, but I think that governments sometimes announce a decision in principle and say we are minded to go in this direction. Once you have said that, it's very difficult to go back. There's no going back. So I was quite happy to, to have that in principle statement out that there would be financial assistance, assistance to those uh, suffering from uh, uh, hepatitis C. Um, now, uh, in terms of Treasury involvement, um, if we could pick matters up at DHSC 00149971116. Um, this is a letter from the Chief Secretary um, to the Treasury, Paul Boateng, um, 27th of August 2003 to you. Um, it says, I'm writing following our conversation of earlier today about your proposed announcement tomorrow of an ex-gracious scheme for victims of hepatitis C in England infected as a result of treatment with NHS blood or blood products. I have real reservations about this course of action, as I have made clear, but well understand the pressures upon the government in England and Wales to which you referred. The risks, however, are real, and the precedent for other cases where there is no formal liability profoundly unhelpful... I am, however, reluctantly prepared to agree to you making an announcement tomorrow subject to the following conditions. Agree to meet the full costs of the scheme from your current settlement and that you agree not to make a claim on the reserve to meet these costs or seeking additional funds to cover them in the forthcoming spending review. That you discuss your proposal with Wales and Northern Ireland and on the assumption that policy responsibility is also devolved or the responsibility of the Northern Ireland office during the suspension of the NIE, reach agreement with them as appropriate concerning any announcement of their introducing similar arrangements for hepatitis C sufferers. This must also be on the understanding that no reserve claim or bid for additional resources and spending review is to be made for these costs either. If in the case of Wales, legal advice subsequently confirms that the policy is reserved, and that there is therefore an issue about who should bear the costs, you must reach agreement with them as appropriate about how the costs are to be met or failing that, agree to cover all such costs yourself. That you further agree and secure a similar agreement with the devolved administrations. That the De Department of Health and devolved administrations will meet in full any future costs incurred. Should there be a legal obligation put in place, comparable payment arrangements arising from any compensation awarded as a direct result of the precedent set by the establishment of the scheme. In handling this announcement, it will be vital to minimise the risk of setting a damaging precedent for other areas. You will want, therefore, to make it clear that this is a unique case whose special characteristics justify the solution proposed. You will, I know, also wish to be proactive in your presentation strategy to ensure this message gets across. Um, now, first of all, do you have any recollection of, of your discussions with Paul Boateng on this issue now? I don't have a detailed, uh, sorry, a recollection of, of detailed discussions with Paul, but I think this represents the view of the Treasury. Uh, well, it doesn't actually represent the initial view of the Treasury. The initial view of the Treasury, um, his default position on everything is no. Um, but this is where they had got to. And if you, I don't think anyone reading that letter can render any illusions that it, 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 it was a tough fight to get there. I mean, not, not personally or physically, but um, they had to be pushed. Um, 
why was it that treasury agreement was required if you weren't putting in a <coughs> bid for the reserves, you weren't going to be putting in any, any um, uh, uh, bids in the forthcoming spending review. You were going to be allocate, allocating to the scheme funds from your existing budget. Why did the Treasury have to agree to that at all? Because, A, it was an aberration from the budget that had been agreed the pre previous year, 2002, when the thing had been reviewed. And, and secondly, um, the, the idea that we wouldn't get money from the reserve or that we couldn't claim it was the outcome of our discussions. It wasn't my starting point. Uh, I mean, ideally, I, if I... I will stand corrected, but I think the HIVs initially money came from the reserve, which is a contingency fund. So it may well be, I can't re recollect, but it may well be I was saying, we have to rectify this injustice, and, and I hope that you will give us money from the reserve. And it's obvious from this that he was saying, no way, Jose, there's no way you're, you're going to get any money from us for the reserve. And incidentally, you can't claim for it um, out of next year's budget. Uh, and you're going to have to accept the risk that this may lead to further uh, payments having been made. Uh, and we ain't paying, we aren't paying any of that either. So it, it, you can see the nature of this. So at the starting point, from a health point of view, wasn't that uh, there's, this couldn't come from the reserve or we couldn't claim for it. This was their conditions upon us, which is what made it so difficult for us to find the money from inside the existing budget. As a matter of fact, you did ultimately find the money from we the did. existing budget. We did. Uh, it, there are complicated issue, but I think the initial view, I can't recollect this at all, it's too detailed for me, and I'm not a finance expert, but I think the initial view of our officials is we had a slight underspend last year, so we'll claim it under the last year's budget, so the starting date, you have to ensure the starting date of any scheme is at the date the Scots first announced their intention, i.e. January. As it happened, that cunning plan was thwarted because Malcolm announced his scheme on the 9th of September meeting uh, that the scheme would commence from the date on which we made the press announcement, 29th of August. So January would have put it into last year's budget, but the 29th of August put it into this year's budget. So they couldn't resolve the problem by into last year's, and the Treasurer was saying, no way you can claim it uh, from the reserve, no way you can claim it in this year's, and indeed, no, no way you're going to be able to claim it next year. Now, just before we leave this letter and, and have a break, I, I can see the Treasurer's entitlement in principle to say no to the reserve because the Treasury guards the reserve, it's their preserve and prerogative to give access to it or not. Did the Treasury have the power to say, uh, or to, to, to prohibit you from, from making a bid for monies in, in, in future spending round um, re reviews and bids? Did they have the power? Yes, if they made it a condition of you spending it this year. That's, you know, pretty tough letter this, isn't it? It's not a love letter. It's, it's, I mean, you can see from the words in it, um, just going back to them, real reservations, uh, risks, formal liability, profoundly unhelpful, and, and it goes on like that throughout it. So it, it's not what you'd call an ex gratia letter, which is saying, oh yes, we're with you in this. It's we think you're taking risks, we don't think you should do it. And then they get on to the implications of, of um, you know, what does this mean uh, if Scotland are taking the initiative and we are following them? In my view, quite simply, 
is if the Scots are doing the right thing, we should do the same thing. Um, sir, I note the time, perhaps uh, the right moment for the morning break. Uh, yes. Well, well, we'll take a, a, a break uh, now until 10 to 12. Um, now, Lord Reid, you're giving evidence, you're, uh, you're giving evidence under oath. Uh, you must not discuss with anyone, whoever that anyone is, anything which you have already been asked about in evidence or anything which you think you may yet be asked about in evidence. Understood. But, but you can talk about anything else you like. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>